Hey there, Commercial Construction Coffee Talk fans. Thanks for chiming in. My name's David Course, and I'm your host. I'm also the publisher and editor of Commercial Construction Renovation Magazine. This is what it used to look like. We're digital. Haven't printed it since August of 2021, but um, I'm uh, grabbing the archives. Oh, September, October 2012. I just grabbed this. I didn't even know what year it was. Um, anyway, Jim Gale, Director of Construction, uh, uh, you know, from uh, Eddie Bauer. It's looking good, and I was like looking to see what I was doing uh, and what was going on, and oh, wow, this brings back memories. This is when I got my uh, black belt uh, back in 2012. I actually blew my knee out two weeks before my black belt test, so I had to have surgery, go through rehab, and then the following year, I got back on the mat, uh, I think seven or eight months later, got my act together, and then I passed my black belt test as a first-degree Taekwondo, so that's what that's from uh memories 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 but uh anyway uh it's always nice uh this was a nice looking issue about almost 120 pages and uh jim thanks for uh gracing the cover but uh don't miss the printer don't miss the uh post office uh been digital it's been an amazing ride transformation from print face to face to the digital world and uh and listen we have millions of people hit our website every month and thank you so much to all of you to do that and uh uh, couldn't have gotten here without you. So you're you're all golden out there on the web. Uh, tuning into this as well as uh, you know hitting our site and see what we have going on, content, magazine, and and all the other stuff that we do. And along with the along with this podcast. So today it's uh, before the weekend, and you got uh, Thanksgiving Thanksgiving week coming up. I've got a nice lady, and uh, actually we're actually pretty much from the same area. Her name is Wendy Mers, and she's from Trinity Consultants, and uh, she's the Director of Sustainability Services, and they're environmental consultants. They help you with all your projects from an environmental standpoint, and I'm gonna let her tell you all about it. But uh, Wendy, say hello, because you just moved, uh, you just moved, right? Yeah, just moved to the Maryland area. Yeah, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Apple. Exactly. Yeah. So she's a Pennsylvanianite, you know, going, you know, going down a little down the Atlantic seaboard. And uh, uh, so welcome commercial construction coffee talk and uh, say hello to our listeners out there. Hi, everyone. Nice to yeah. be here on this Friday afternoon, working towards yeah. the weekend here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, we we're honored to have you. And uh, the way it'll work is this. Uh, we're going to. Uh, You'll tell your story, where you grew up, where you went to school, and how you ended up at Trinity. Then we'll talk about uh, lessons learned from the roller coaster that we've been on over the last couple of years. And uh, I know you have a report that just came out. And then you'll leave one positive thought, uh, you know, or phrase for our listeners, and we'll close it out. So I do have a sponsor, though, for our show today, and they're called the Contractor Consultants. And uh, they help people, uh, you know, with hiring, and they have a new solution. So I have, I have a little video that we're going to do, and then we'll come back and hear your story. So everybody... Uh, watch the video and we'll see you uh, shortly. Hey, everybody. If you are out there struggling to hire, I want to introduce you to the Contractor Consultants. This firm is putting recruiters and staffing agencies out of business. If you're a construction firm struggling to hire, want to expand your team and sick and tired of sifting resumes and administrative burden of hiring, well I have something very special for you. These guys have figured it out and made hiring faster, easier, and more affordable. Endorsed by ZipRecruiter, Indeed, and they work nationwide in 87 industries. So if you want to put your hiring to bed for a small monthly fee, you can learn a new better way, a more effective way to hire. To find out more, text HIRE to 66866, that's HIRE to 66866. You show up on the call, and you'll learn a few new things about hiring. These guys wrote the book, the course, and do it every day. Thanks for listening. All right. Thanks for watching the uh, the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, back to the show. So, Wendy, uh, like I said, tell us your story, and uh, the floor is yours. All right. Well, this might take a little while. I'm, I'm kind of old, but uh, I was uh, started my story in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I was born and raised there. Um, and I uh, went to college uh, next door in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania at Lehigh University, um, chemical engineer, graduated in the early 80s from there. 
Um, and my first job out of college was with the oil industry for mobile oil. And I worked um, as a tech service engineer, mostly because when I got out of engineering school, I realized I didn't really want to work in a plant environment. I am a people person. So I, I looked for something that was, you know, kind of uh, dealing with people in a technical sense. Um, and at that point, that was working with um, mobile oils, you know, uh, marketing and um, commercial sales folks and, and also their technical folks. So I uh, did that for six years. And then um, for personal reasons, my, my husband got uh, actually moved to Cincinnati. My husband got transferred there. Um, I was pregnant with our first child. So uh, I decided to take some time off, um, which lasted about nine months. And I was climbing the walls a little bit. And um, yeah, so I, I said, well, goes. maybe I'll go back to school. Um, and so I went to University of Cincinnati and picked up a you know course program thinking I'd get an MBA and literally was leaping through it and saw environmental engineering. And I thought, wow, that sounds really interesting. And maybe better use of my my undergrad in chemical engineering. So I I went to their uh, master's pro through their master's program and there was a real focus on air quality. Um, so graduated from there in the early 90s. Um, and uh, what was happening at the time is there were new amendments that came out with the Clean Air Act. Um, mm -hmm. And we um, there was a need to for large industry sites to um, get federal permits for to operate. It's called Title V permits. And so I did a lot of original Title V permits, um, mostly for cement plants. So have a look, have that link to the construction materials early on in my career. Um, and what that entailed was really going to different cement plants and crawling around and finding where all of the emission um, sources vented to and, and drawing process flow diagrams and then calculating from all those vents what the emissions were and putting together an application and getting a, a permit so that was my early um, environmental engineering experience um, did that on a part-time basis which in up through about 2000 um, which was not really a thing back then but uh, luckily i worked for companies that were amenable to me um, you know, working part time and even sometimes from home, which that was kind of before Internet. So that, you know, phone calls that wasn't and... happening back then. <laughs> working at working out of the house. Uh, very, very few people did that. Yeah, you know, like it is yeah. today. Exactly. Um, but uh, during the course of time, we moved a, a couple of times. So being in, in consulting um, was a good path. Um, because I could find work wherever we moved to. We lived in mm -hmm. Maryland for a couple years. We uh, lived in Michigan and then ended up in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, so that was about 2000. Um, at that point, my children, I have two children, son and a daughter, uh, were in school. And I got the idea of maybe being a teacher. So I left industry, um, got a um, secondary ed certification and um, taught high school chemistry for five years. Wow. I'm missing Pennsylvania. So, why I'm missing that? There's a name from the past. Yeah. For those of you, that's right outside of Philadelphia, by the way, if you don't yeah. know. Yeah. So, taught chemistry for five years. Um, and then our kids started looking at college, and I, I thought, well, maybe I should get back into industry. I kind of missed. Uh, that work and and um, although I'll, I'll say teaching was one of the most challenging uh, jobs I've done. Um, there's I give a lot of credit. Uh, that teaching is a is, is very um, demanding. Um, yeah, but enjoy, you know has its rewards, but it's it's demanding. So I uh, ended up going back. Um, and when I was looking to get back into industry, I reached out to someone that I was working with when we were in Maryland. Um, and said, hey, could you be a reference for me? There's a local, you know, consulting firm. I'm going to see if I can, you know, get a job with them. And he said, well, if you're looking to get back into consulting, I'm with this new company called Trinity Consultants. And um, he was located in the Frederick, Maryland office for Trinity, um, which was about the furthest north. We had one in, in New Jersey at that time, um, but that was about it. And uh, he said, you can work for me and work from home. And so I, I joined Trinity. Um, 
in uh, 2007, so 16 years ago, um, as a senior consultant. And um, at that time, Trinity had about 250 employees. Um, we did mostly air quality work, still owned by the original owner uh, who started a gentleman um, in Dallas, Texas, who started the company uh, back in the 70s um, with a really focusing on air quality and air dispersion modeling. Um, and uh, that uh, owner uh, retired shortly after I, I started and we were sold to private equity firm. And since then I've had several owners and we've grown astronomically over the last 16 years so that's what money does yeah the comes you know you scale the business yep and so we've expanded our offerings we you know multi-media environmental consulting but also now have um capabilities in the built environment and in ecological um services and safety and we're now um over 1,600 employees. We have wow, nice um, offices not not only across the U.S. but also um, in Asia and Europe and Australia. So it's been an exciting journey. Um, during that time, um, you know, I started as a senior consultant and, and moved up the ranks. And um, in 2013, had the opportunity to to start uh, our Philadelphia office. So I I put a stake in the ground in Philadelphia for Trinity. That was, that was um, challenging, but rewarding at the same time. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. So we have uh, an office in Exton. Um, I managed that office for about seven years um, and then uh, was ready to, to step down from, from the you know, operations management, but was working with clients. So over that time, Philadelphia area in particular work, got the opportunity to work across a lot of industry sectors. You know, so we worked in, with the refinery that was in Philadelphia. Uh, oh, Philadelphia, sure. You know, and yeah, right um, there by the airport. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, cement in the Lehigh Valley area, cement and lime, um, natural gas transmission, you know, chemical manufacturing. You know, so a, a wide uh, variety. And, and um, Trinity is very entrenched in in those types of industries, and you know, uh, especially with respect to um, kind of the challenging uh, environmental um, things that come up. And so uh, we noticed in the last couple of years that uh, our clients were coming to us with respect to sustainability reporting and especially around climate strategy, you know, how, how to, because they were, um, their management was either making commitments to reduce their carbon footprint and they were coming to us and saying, we, you know, we, to meet these reduction targets, but we, you know, we need help in strategizing with that, or we want to set targets, but we want to, you know, do that a bit more, uh, you know, methodical and and have to you know, figure out what we can commit to. So started seeing that kind of work coming in, and um, saw a need to uh, come up with a cohesive strategy across our, you know, service offerings. And so um, in 2022. I, I took on this role uh, as the director of our sustainability services and really have been growing our practice, you know, uh, across um, Trinity in the last two years. Um, and so what my team does is we work with our local offices to identify opportunities and, and kind of figure out how we can support our, our clients. It's applying our, like our technical acumen and our understanding of environmental compliance that we've learned you know through permitting and and you know regulatory requirements but to sustainability which is more of a voluntary um you know uh, approach yeah. and so but still you know and so as a result really requires some strategic advisement and understanding because you know you want to make sure you're still staying economically viable, but also keeping up with what your stakeholders, your customers, your investors, uh, your employees are expecting with respect to, um, you know, addressing your environmental footprint. And so, so that's, that's where I'm at today. So. What an amazing story. Uh, you know, I used to go uh, every summer, uh, there was a, uh, in Wyoming, the hockey rink there, uh, I went to a hockey school for two weeks. It was like the prep school 
all-star hockey school and uh we played hockey in the summer you know all week long at the Wyomissing rink so I, I knew that ride very well you know going up through Collegeville before the bypass when I was growing yeah. up and you know we're from the same area and mm -hmm. uh, uh we were talking about you know it was funny when I uh when I all the grandsons, like I, before we got on, we all got our license at 16 in Pennsylvania, but we all had to go work in the scrapyard. So uh, at the end of the day, because of OSHA, I, I had to, uh, you know, take the shower, get all the lead off me and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I got put on this job on I-95 in Philly and we were uh, dem demoing these uh, buildings and we had to get all the asbestos off all the pipes before we knocked down the building. So talking about air quality. So I'm in there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's in the middle of summer. So come on, guys. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in there in my white suit, my gloves, whatever. And this 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 uh, crew comes in and uh, they're not wearing their masks. And uh, I'm like, aren't you going to wear your mask? And they're like, oh, I don't need that stinking mask. <laughs> and there went as long. And I'm like, I'm putting my mask on. And uh, so, uh, you know, all of that, all of the rules and regulations, you know, back then were mu so much more lax. But today, I'm glad that they're in there because my whole thing is we yeah. want you to be safe. It doesn't matter what you're building or what construction site that you're on. We want you to be safe and get home. And we also don't want you to get sick from anything. You know, so, you know, with all the asbestos, so I, I was I was uh, one day uh, for a couple of weeks, I was the hose guy, you know, and I'd be mm -hmm. watering down all the uh, asbestos they were knocked on because all the dust gets all over the place. So. Uh, but what a what a great story! Teacher, mom, you know, consultant, making your your ways around. You know, I lived in Cincinnati for two years too. Oh, uh, really? We where, love where, where did you live in Cincinnati when you were there? Loveland. So, oh yeah. Oh, so you're out there on the, the Beltway, Beltway, like the Northeast. Yeah. yeah. I, I lived downtown, and my 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 mom is remarried, my, and they were my stepdad was from Dayton. He was a jeweler, and uh, but I moved to Cincinnati, uh, and I lived downtown. A place called Fourth and Plum, and it was an old garage that they made into basically apartments. Uh, but I had a killer view of the river, and I was about seven or eight floors up, and there was a building called SNL Data, and they kept building the floors. I was watching them doing the construction. All of a sudden, they took my view away, and that's when I left and I moved to Louisville. Oh, really? But yeah, and then I went to Greensboro, and then ended up in Atlanta, and then I started my publishing career. Uh, but uh, have fond memories of Cincy, and uh, a lot still. I'm a Philly boy all the way, you know. They're, you know, yeah. it, you know, and uh, you know, as Pennsylvanianites, you know, we, we we have that connection. It's just you know one of those things. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, and being a teacher, it it's it's not easy. And uh, whether you're in private school or public school, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's it, it it's definitely a challenging. Uh, commitment because you want your students to learn but you mm -hmm. also want to make sure that anything that they take with you that they can take with you down the road so they can look back and say hey you know uh teacher Murs, man she was awesome i remember a couple of really things that she taught me and you don't yeah. get that but you know you're proud of it, am i right oh absolutely yeah i i don't regret it for one minute it was you know it was challenging but a really you know, great five years that, and, and also just the, the other teachers that I work with were great as well. So it's a real, um, yeah, it was a great experience. It just, uh, um, I, I move around, moved around a bunch earlier. Cause I, I also find like, once I figure out the job, if it starts to get too repetitive, I think I have a short attention span. You get bored. Exactly. And that's, I've been with Trinity 16 years and I've never been bored. And I think it's just the way we, the types of projects that we do and the wide variety of clients that we have, it's always something new. And I, I mean, I'm still learning every day, um, you know, and especially with this new, with, with climate change and, and, you know, evolving policy and there's always something new and that's what keeps me coming back, you know, every day to, I always tell people the day you stop learning is the day you should go do something else because you're going to be bored. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, so, I mean, I learned, that's like here, I learned something new every day and uh, I made, you know, I made the transformation and I still have fun. And, but when I get bored, I'm going to have to go do something, but I can't just sit home uh, and, you know, hit golf balls or fit. I got to do something, you know, I got to stay, I got to keep my mind sharp, you know, and I can't, I'm not going to let chat, chat GBT do everything, you know? So. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think that when I was saying, you know, I, first child and I thought I'd be home for a while I remember my my husband coming home one day and I'm like 
I am like literally sitting here worried about the color of the kitchen curtains. I need to find something else to do. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? It's just so. It's, so making a nice segue, you know, with you know air quality and so forth. March 2020 comes around. Construction's booming, cranes all over the place, low unemployment, you know, no, you know, the only thing is, you know, finding permitters or foremans to get the job done. And all of a sudden, March comes around, the roller coaster starts. Uh, oh, it's going to be a couple of weeks and a couple of months. Here we are, three and a half years later, and we're still talking about it. We're out, but there's still little bumps and potholes that, you know, we're, we're experiencing. And uh, talk about, how your company kind of weathered that storm, and then we'll talk about your report. Sure, sure. Actually, I'd say we weathered it very well um, because we are, you know, our uh, work, we can, um, we were able to adapt pretty readily to working from home. Most of our work is, you know, on the computer. It's funny, mm -hmm. before COVID, we would go into the office and like say hi, but then go in our offices, shut the door because we're on, we're talking to clients. I always felt like I, I got to know my clients better than my colleagues in the office because that's who I was really talking to more. So I think our business, you know, was, could adjust better. And um, there was still, you know, maybe there wasn't as much construction going on there for a while, but there was still compliance needs. So we, we do both, you know, construction permitting as well as just ongoing compliance. And there was a resource need in that space that we could fill. Um, so I, I think we were fortunate in, the, in that we could continue to work and um, you know, help our clients with the needs that they were, were coming up against with respect to what was happening. So yeah, there's the whole... resources and yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, listen, uh... If a lot of a lot of projects were deemed essential, so the 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 construction workers they put their masks on. They were troopers. They went out, got on the planes, and kept things going. So I kind of looked at them as uh, you know frontline you know uh, essential workers. And uh, you know looking back at some of the people that I've talked to over the last three years, I've you know in person or on the phone or on Zoom or like you know we're doing today, they've all said that they had you know the amazing transformation was. Not only did they have really good years, but also that they also found out that there's uh, more to life than just work, yeah. and and that that that's been a really big change about people. And now it's tough getting people to come back to the office because they realize that they can be productive at the house. They don't have to burn gas and be in rush hour traffic. And uh, you know, if you need to get, you know, you can schedule your meetings so you're not in all that mess. And that you know certain people have to be in that work in that office environment don't get me wrong right a lot of people like i was working out of the house just like you so i it didn't even phase me uh but i knew a lot of people they just can't work out of the house and and they they need that structured environment but so many architects contractors you know brands uh developers i've talked to so many people over the last couple of years and they've all said it's been great uh now the challenge is you know do i want to bring the people back do i want to make it hybrid do I need this big office space? Maybe we should downsize a little or yeah, right. you know, so that's the the paradigm that's kind of in there, you know, as at, at, you know, at the sea level running these companies, because you don't want to, you, you know, they've proven themselves that they can actually get things done mm -hmm. and projects have moved, moved smoothly. We're profitable. We're growing. But they, I want to keep my company culture. But just like you said, hi, door shut. Leave yeah. me <laughs> I'm talking to my peeps. Right. And, uh, so it, it's not shocking, but the, the companies that were kind of set up the way you were, were probably the most, uh, just the most effective ones because some people, they had to buy laptops and get everything and get all the, the, the yeah. infrastructure set up. And, um, and just like me, I had a digital magazine forever. I just kind of just, it was there so someone could use it. But all over the years we were, we were putting, I was posting stuff before blogging even became even a word. Yeah. And. So when I, you know, went to digital, I didn't even realize how many thousands and thousands of con pages, of content, not including all the all the magazines that that were there. And it was a, it was it was just a treasure trove of information and content and data that was there. And I just didn't really use it. But it was there, luckily, yeah. when I made the, the pivot, which I've said a million times. But uh, uh, when I did make the transformation from digital uh, you know, from print to digital, it was very scary. 
because I was a print guy and right. going, oh, I'm not going to have a magazine, you know, to hold. But after a while, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, now I look back, it's, it was probably the best decision that I, and listen, down there, everybody's going to be on the web. And, yeah. uh, you know, so. Yeah, it, it's funny. It, our, it kind of coincided with our company adopting um, some Microsoft tools like Teams. Mm-hmm. And so the Teams meeting, I actually find I, we work more effectively together, even with people in the same office, because now we're just naturally call me on Teams and I can share you know, what I'm working on, I can show you the spreadsheet, I can show you, you know, so I, we weren't used to doing that before. So I actually feel like we're a little more effective just because we were forced to use some of these tools that may have been at our disposal before, but we just weren't accustomed to using. So they're not going anywhere. Even yeah. though people tell me every day, oh, I've done so many Zoom calls or Teams call. Oh, I don't want to get another one. It's not going away. They yeah. can they don't want to get on a plane. I mean, I'm a million miler here in Delta. I, I don't care if I get on a plane ever again. You know, traveling. Right. I've I've been to Vegas. I've been to LA. I mean, I've I've done my traveling. Right. Uh, but now I can pick and choose, you know, where I want to go. And and from a construction standpoint, uh, you know, I had a project management firm. I, I know I've told the story for some of you that listen to a lot of these things, but I had a I had a project manager tell me one day he's like, hey, in one day I was in Saudi Arabia, South America, I, I was in Central America, I was in Canada, I did a couple walkthroughs, I did that all in a day. If I did this before the roller coaster started in March of 2020, that would have taken me three weeks to do, and a lot of gas and a lot of travel and st- mm-hmm. hotels and all that stuff. Now I can pick and choose where I want to do my in person things, and if there's a, a deal with a a roof curb on top of, of, a, of a facility. I don't need to go drive an hour and a half. Just do the FaceTime with me and I can figure it out with the with the the super that's on the project. So, it, it you know, this is not going any way. It is a tool. I had it. I rarely used it. Just like my podcast. I just bought my mic. I was going to do these uh, interviews on con- with with, you know, on the construction site. That's the way I want to do it, wear my hard hat and, and, you know, interview and they show me stuff and then everything got shut down. And I was like, okay, I'll just start doing these once a week. And I was awful in the beginning. I mean, all, people laughed at me. I was having fun. I didn't care. And, uh, <laughs> but now I'm almost uh, 170 episodes. And I mean, I got all my, I think I have almost 600 videos up on my, on my channel from all the events that we did over the years. And, um, but it's, it's, it's just that. You, you know, you learn, you make mistakes and you get better at it. And uh, but this is not going away. And uh, uh, but I still like in person cannot be replaced. You cannot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And part but, of our our marketing um, has always been teaching classes, which is, you know, I liked I came from teaching and then came to Trinity and they said, well, you know, we really do a lot of our marketing by giving, you know, luncheons or doing full day, full day courses, which I really enjoy because it keeps me sharp on, you know, what what we're uh, working, you know, the, the regulations and things like that. And so that's something that suffered a little bit over COVID, but we got into doing these webinars, which I have to admit, I really don't like teaching a half day or a full day course sitting at my desk and talking to a computer. Like you don't get that reaction, you know, you're not seeing, is it sinking in? It, it, it's less conducive to kind of, you know, somebody interrupting and asking a question, like, because you don't have that eye contact. So I have been really excited in the last uh, year or two to get back to in-person instruction. Hey, uh, listen, I was doing a cocktail party once a month uh, in January of 2020. I just had my summit, my 10th anniversary. Uh, We had the most people we had ever attended. I was in Coconut Grove at a shopping center that was getting uh, renovated and then I was in Milwaukee looking at hotels for our executive retreats. And then everything got, you know, oh, wow. yeah. and um, and then I did everything virtually for almost two years. I didn't, get, I didn't travel at all. I got in the car and drove. And uh, this year I told my wife, I go, look, I got to get back on the road. I got to go see who's who, what's going on. So I got I walked a bunch of shows. I was walking probably 30 trade shows a year, concrete oh, lighting wow. signage. I mean, I was. Uh, so I've been on the road this year and it's been really, really fun to see people I haven't seen in a while, but I don't miss the travel at all because, yeah. it's, you know, I've done it. And but it was good to see people that I hadn't seen people where they've, they've retired or they've gone to another firm and the, 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 you know, the new generation coming in. And so that all has been really, really exciting. Uh, and uh, but the technology is just, you know, you, you, you have an option. 
where before it was just, you know, go on the road, be a road right. warrior. And now you can get the both the best of both worlds. And as an event person, believe me, the first year I did my virtual events, we had a, a humorous. Now I had seen June in person and she was hilarious because she could feed off of the uh, audience. Right, right. But when she did it on the virtual, uh, I wasn't sure if people were, were enjoying it because you're looking at them all on the screen. Yeah. And, Maybe yeah. some of them are laughing and or they're like, you know, I'm going to get a nasty. Hey, Dave, she wasn't funny, you know, or whatever. But I thought, but she still got really good marks. So then uh, I did a hybrid. I did a couple of hybrid events last year. And then this year, uh, I just did an event in New York. We did it all in person. And uh, I like that model where I can go bring it on. And I don't need to do, get, we do, you don't need the big hotels to do it. We, uh, intimate, it's not always bigger. It's not always better. And we, uh, you know, we had 25, 30 people. It was a great little four hour afternoon in the city. And um, it, you know, so I, I, you kind of have to be flexible with things. And you kind of, you know, everyone's going to make mistakes. Things aren't always going to way that, that you pan out, but you got to try things. And I think massaging technology with in-person and picking the right mediums between them is the wave of the future. It just is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, well, Let's let's bridge into your report. Talk about the report that your that your you know you game your company came out with. Sure. Yeah. So we um, actually uh, commissioned a report, uh, independent research by Verdantix, uh, their research firm, because um, we wanted to understand. You know, I said we're building this um, this business in sustainability services, and um, so we wanted to understand what our clients' needs were, and we want we focused it on the construction material sectors. Because we recognize that they have, you know, the steel and cement and glass, and you know, they have the the biggest challenges with respect to decarbonization. And so we really want to just understand where they were with respect to their climate strategy, where their pain points were, like in the near term. A lot of, you know, sustainability consulting is looking, you know, kind of more down the road on here's what we need to do, you know, obviously by 2050, but we wanted to focus on what do you need to do in the next five years? What's what's you know the what's the practical approach here? Where what are you looking at? What do you need help with? Right. So so they uh, embarked on this research. It was anonymous interviews with a um, hundred individuals, executives from uh, with titles in you know environmental health and safety or sustainability ESG or operations from a medium to large size companies that were manufacturers of construction materials. So um, the companies had um, a, a revenue of at least $250 million a year. So, you know, uh, large, mid to large size. Um, and so it was like metals manufacturers, uh, wood products, uh, cement, concrete, glass, um, some others like asphalt, gypsum, brick. Okay. Mm -hmm. all, all located in North America because, you know, wanted to see what the what the market is here you know eat the europeans are are a bit ahead of us in that market and you know so we just kind of wanted to see how things were evolving in the u.s and so they asked questions about you know what's influencing uh their decarbonization activity so what are their drivers um you know there is it regulatory is it stakeholder pressure um is it brand you know reputation um, you know, asking what, uh, so a lot of sustainability is, you know, public disclosure and there's in the last, you know, three to five years, there's been a lot of different frameworks and standards coming out and, and more and more coming out um, in certain sectors. So I want to understand what, what frameworks they were reporting under, what challenges they were facing, you know, what strategies then they were using to reduce their carbon footprint. So that, that was the line of, of questioning. Um, and, and, you know, so uh, focusing on the sector two, um, you know, the CO2 emissions from the combined um, effect of building um, operation as well as construction and, and taking into consider that embodied carbon in the materials accounts for about 37% of global um, energy and process related carbon emissions. So it's a big sector and a challenging sector to tackle. And so, um, you know, some of the information it was was insightful. Um, you know, I think the biggest driver, interestingly, in, in North America is not regulation at this point. You know, we're not seeing a whole lot out of at the federal level anyway, although there's a lot of 
uh, initiatives with the um, Inflation Reduction Act tax credits and and funding, but really it's it's supply chain pressure. So um, you know the bigger companies, the, the um, international companies um, have have already made some pretty um, aggressive uh, commitments, set short term goals, and so they are now and they are requiring those reductions of their suppliers because they're taking into account the impact of their entire value chain. And so that seems to be the biggest driver in this sector. Uh, I feel like we're getting a lot of uh, requests recently from folks saying, you know, we have a, our biggest customer is asking us what our product carbon footprint is, what's the embodied carbon, and not just in the construction materials, it's starting to get into the chemical um, uh, industries and other industries as well. So. Um, and then also um, just what uh, um, they're doing to decarbonize. So in the short term, there's a lot of emphasis on doing um, energy audits, understanding you know, where they can reduce their energy usage, doing energy efficiency projects, especially for some of these sectors that are waiting for, um, you know, technology to get to the point where they can decarbonize. So like carbon capture and sequestration for cement or, you know, alternative uh, technologies for, for steel making. Um, so they're looking in the short term uh, more at energy conservation or, or um, electrification of, of uh, processes that can be electrified rather than use fossil fuels. So again, um, that, that was, you know, good to get that insight. Um, also, it was interesting that of the 100 um, companies that were surveyed, 68% of them, or 68 of them, um, have set short-term greenhouse gas yes. goals. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, you know, are sharing them publicly. 34 of them have done that through, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Science-Based Target Initiative, but that is a um, organization that has come up with a framework for establishing goals that are aligned with science so that, you know, and they certify them and say, yes, if you, you know, a, a, align your goal setting with our framework, and then, you know, we can certify that this is, you know, going to be. And they're obtainable and they're, and they're and they're obtainable. Yeah. They're realistic, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, yeah, they're, they, they're aggressive, but yes, realistic, right? So, and they're, and they are really advocating for setting targets in the near term, right? We can't just say we're going to reduce by 2050 and not do anything between now and, and then. So, yeah. yep. So um, I think that is an area that um, these companies are going to be focusing on, um, you know, in the near, in the near term. And so I think for, for your audience, as far as, you know, in the construction industry, I think there will continue to be, uh, you know, pressure to understand the, the carbon value of the materials that you're using in your construction projects, right? And so right now, a lot of the work we're doing um, is life cycle assessment for the, these, these materials. But, you know, we have, as part of this big merger and acquisition that we've done at Trinity, we have, um, you know, companies that we've acquired that are in the built environment that are, you know, in the construction industry, we have, you know, acoustic engineers, we have MEP capabilities, um, you know, and, and lead, uh, we provide lead um, st uh, strategic advisement. And so my, as a result of this um, survey, you know, we're seeing that there's, there's probably going to be need for, or an opportunity for us to extend our sustainability services into that pillar of our company, the built environment, to provide you know some services, similar services, like looking at a whole building life cycle assessment. So when you know the the buildings being designed, you're looking at the the overall footprint of the materials you're using um, to assess you know to meet you know lead requirements or other requirements that are evolving. Um, also, a lot of need for um, like I was talking about energy efficiency and, and audit, you know, um, strategies and doing energy audits. We're starting to see that even in the regulatory arena, like New York City um, passed a regulation where, you know, you have uh, construction, building construction 
uh, have to look at you know the, the carbon footprint associated with it and look at energy efficiency measures um, you know uh, just to meet these city uh, regulations so um, yeah I see a lot of opportunity um, in you know this uh, industry sector in, in particular and so this study is really helping us to understand that and also just uh, providing a good benchmarking for companies in that sector to understand you know what others are are doing and how they're aligning their their uh, strategies so as they say times are a changing they you are know? you yeah. bet you got to stay informed so um it so any of you out there on commercial construction coffee talk you know whether you're you know a manufacturer of architectural building products or you're you're a building owner or you've got real estate and you're thinking about all this and you want to get your hands on the report or you want to reach out to wendy to you know bounce some ideas that you were thinking about maybe doing an energy audit or uh, whatever the case may be how would someone reach out to you at trinity well they can find us at, at our website at trinityconsultants.com uh, we also are going to be having a webinar where we're going to go into more detail. We'll have um, on the on the report on December 6th, um, and you can find that information on our website. It's at noon central time, and we're going to have a panel um, discussion. So I'll be on the panel with some of my associates, but we also have someone from Verdantix that did the research that can kind of talk about the raw data that they collected, which I think will be very insightful. And then we also have... Um, someone from the Steel Manufacturers Association, an industry group that we work with, as well as someone from um, industry that's a sustainability manager to kind of talk about their journeys and what they're seeing um, in their industries as well to, to kind of just, um, you know, allow, add a little more, um, you know, insight with respect to what we found in the, in the research. So that's, again, December 6th at 12 Central. You can find the information on Trinity's website. Um, and, you know, I, I think it'll be a really good conversation to, uh, a little more about along these same lines about what's happening in the industry. So if you're out there and you want to find out December 6th, go to the Trinity website and uh, you can find out all this stuff. And and I'm sure that uh, you'll you'll enjoy it. Hey, if anybody want, wants to reach me, they can get me at David C at CCR mag.com. Listen, the way that Wendy got on here. Their publicist sent me a press release. I saw it. I was like, oh, yeah, this would be really cool. And here she is. So if you want to be on the episode or uh, get something in, uh, you know, in the magazine or up on our social media, send me something. Don't be, you know, it's I, I know you don't like me saying this, but it's like playing the lottery. If you don't buy a ticket, you can't win. So if you don't send me something, I can't look at it. Very tough to get in the magazine, but we have all these other social media posts all day long. And don't prejudge it. It could be an anniversary. It could be a new product announcement. It could be, uh, uh, you know, a charity golf tournament that you're doing. We look at everything. We'll find a place for it. We'll post it. We'll sing in the URL. You can share it. It's good for your SEO, search engine optimization for you, uh, you know, computer geeks out there on the web. And, um, uh, you know, it's a win-win. So send me stuff. We look at everything. Our turnaround time, you know, 24, 48 hours, we'll send it to you. And uh, we love looking at stuff, everything, you know. and um, I, listen, we get a couple million people a month that come to our site, not because it looks good, it's because we have really good content. And a lot of it's construction, but I also put a lot of other stuff on there because, like I said, people found out that it's not all work. You have a life. So I put stuff on there, you know, how to buy the right cell phone or how to buy the right insurance or uh, we put all sorts of stuff on there. It, the, the majority is construction, but I do have diversified a little over the last couple of years. So uh, a couple things before we, uh, uh, you know, end the discussion is that uh, uh, number one, we want you to be safe on the construction site. Okay. We want you to get home, be able to see your kids, your, you know, your, your spouse, have a good dinner, catch some Z's and be able to go out and do it the next day. Number two, we want you to be safe, you know, safe on the site. The way you do it is by staying hydrated, okay? Dehydration is the worst. You get headaches. That's when accidents happen. So, you know, grab your bottle of water, put some electrolytes in there, and there there you go. Cheers. And um, stay liquefied. You'll feel much better. And lastly, listen, hit the like button on there, all right? Hit the subscribe button. We want to get the algorithms and uh, have people find this uh uh, episode out on the web and, and and what Wendy had to say and about the report and the carbonization and, and and being you know environmentally safe as we you know we're all building stuff uh you know 
that's what it's all about. So make sure you hit that like button so we can get this uh, going around the web. So as we finish up, Wendy, uh, we're finishing up Q4. The you know got about five weeks left, or you know from the year's done, we're going into 2024. So if you wanted to leave our audience with one positive thought or phrase, uh, what would it be? So um, I think along the lines of what we talked about today, I'd say climate change is one of the biggest challenges of our time. But I'm working uh, day in and day out with with individuals that are really uh, committed and passionate about um solving the challenge and i'm optimistic uh that we can make a difference um uh, with what i'm seeing so i guess that would be my positive message yeah you know i i always say it's uh you know cta call to action you know if you see something you got to act on it if you don't act on it you're going to wish you did down the road so if you start a year from now you'll look back and go i'm glad i did it so yeah. i'm right there with you so um with that said, everybody, you got Thanksgiving next week, and then you got uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, you can throw Festivus in there from Seinfeld, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and then you got New Year's, and boom, this year's over. 2023 has been an amazing wild ride. I'm mentally drained every day, and I catch some days I wake up and I do it all over again. Uh, and uh, you know, 2024, tighten your seatbelt because it's just going to be just as wild as 2023 was. And uh, but never, never a dull day. I mean, there's so, so much stuff going on in the world today. I just don't, I don't even, I don't even know what's going on. It's just, it's just a crazy place out there, but I'm having fun. I always look at the glass half full, half empty. You know what? I'm just glad I have a glass to look at. So, uh, you know, and uh, hopefully it's carbon and, and built safe, you know, so uh, all that stuff. But uh, Wendy, what a pleasure. Um, uh, you're, you're my neighbor in Reading outside of Pottstown. And uh, you know. we'll talk about Allentown before we're getting on there. And uh, now I knew you were a Cincyite. And uh, OK, you were in Cincy. Was it Skyline or was it uh, Gold Star? Oh, Skyline. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I had a guy on that the, the, the other day. He's from Skyline, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I do the three way. And I, no onions on my hot dog." I'm the three way also. Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> it's uh, once again, Skyline came up on the podcast. I, I don't make this stuff up. It just happens, you know. So uh, well, anyway, pleasure having on you. Uh, hopefully, one of these days we'll get to meet you in person and um, uh, enjoy. Thanks for the, the opportunity. Yeah, and I was going to say, say goodbye to everybody out in the audience out there on Commercial Construction Coffee Talk. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for uh, listening, and uh, please reach out if you have any questions or wmers at trinityconsultants.com. There you go. And uh, I'm going to sign off from Sugar Hill, just below the Buford Dam, about uh, 25 miles uh, north of downtown ATL. And uh, listen, next week, just a little uh, hint. Or advice, don't talk politics with your family unless you want them to leave, all right? No politics. And make sure you have fun, eat some food, watch some football, hang out. Most importantly, cleanse your mind. Get rid of all the negativity, positive mindset to start the, you know, the last week. And uh, I don't have time for negativity. Just get rid of it. You know, it's not helping anybody. So uh, with that said, everybody, enjoy, you know, have a great Thanksgiving coming up. And uh, we will see you next time on another episode of Commercial Construction Coffee Talk. Wendy, a pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed the uh, conversation, and uh, uh, we will see you, all right, down the road. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.